Hey, what's going on guys? Welcome back to the Lights, Camera, Grow podcast. This is episode four. If you missed the first three episodes, don't forget to go back and check those out. Andrew and I dive into what it takes to make a marketing video. We go through the basics all the way till how to get started. In this episode, we change up the topic just a little bit. We still talk about video and marketing, but we talk about how it pertains to sales and your process. We interview a couple of guys from HubSpot, Nick and John. They work with the HubSpot sales team. They're gonna deep dive into everything you need to know about how to use video in your sales process. If you like what you're hearing, make sure you subscribe to the Lights, Camera, Grow podcast so you can catch up on all the episodes. You can find us in iTunes, Spotify, or anywhere you find a podcast. Cool, all right, um, yeah, let's go ahead and kick it off. So. First off, thanks for being here with us today, guys. Uh, we really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules. We know you guys are like always jam-packed, especially here at the beginning of the year. So really proud and excited to have you guys here on the Lights, Camera, Girl podcast. Um, like we said in our last episode, this is a new series for us. We're really deep diving into video marketing and video sales. And this is episode number four, and this is gonna be all about video sales and video marketing, kind of a nice segue that we're gonna talk about. Yep. Um, so yeah, thanks guys, thanks for being here. We're here with Nick Saltzman and John Ippolito. Did I say that correctly? <laughs> You said it perfectly. I'm excited to be here. So, nice. And I'm excited you pronounced my name the right way. So. Me too. Me too. <laughs> we don't have to go back and uh, and cut a new intro for that. So yeah, thank, thanks guys for being yeah, here. Yeah, people aren't going to realize the 40 or 50 outtakes that of just you saying my <laughs> yeah. name wrong that we're going to have to post. Edit, we'll just keep so. the outtakes in there or we'll use those for social. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good blooper reel. Yeah, for sure. Uh, cool. So, Andrew, you want to go ahead and kick it off? I know you had some like really yeah. upfront questions to ask. Yeah, these guys. definitely. So, just maybe for all of our podcast guests that are out there listening, um, I know I know Nick because Nick had uh, brought Toby Agency into the HubSpot Ag Agency Partner Program, and um, you know Nick, it's been an amazing partnership with you guys. I think we've learned a lot from you guys. I think it's I've always kind of called our partnership with HubSpot as like one of the purest forms of a partnership. Um, with all the support that HubSpot has really given us. And uh, you, have a, you guys have a lot of knowledge on uh, sales. And in fact, Nick, I know specifically you with video enabling sales. Um, and maybe we haven't met John before. So if you don't mind, John, would you mind introducing yourself first before we jump into some of the questions? Sure. Yeah. Full name's John Ippolito, pronounced perfectly by Lights, Camera, Grow. Uh, I have been at HubSpot for just under four years now, which sounds like not a ton of time, but in HubSpot years without fast for growing, I, I feel like an old dog every so often. Uh, but I am an agency partner specialist. So very similar role to Nick and for everyone listening that isn't familiar with the kind of Nick's role, we work with HubSpot's agency partner program for net new agencies. Agencies looking to grow better like you guys that are curious about how they could work with us in that true form of partnership. So I've been doing that. Uh, I started actually as a cold calling BDR, came nice. to HubSpot, a little less cold calling, uh, but still was very much prospecting motion, booking meetings. And uh, after a year, I became like a full closing rep for our partner program and have been doing it ever since. Right on, man. Nice. Cool. Thanks for that intro. So I'm going to ask a super basic question right now. And I think there's actually a, a big misconception around this question, which is what is sales and what is marketing? How are they different? And where do they connect with each other? Which well, comes first? Yeah. What comes <laughs> first, right? So I'll, Nick, why don't you start off with that? I'd love to hear your perspective. Oh, that's a huge question. So I guess I'll start with kind of what is sales? I mean, I think sales is a lot of things. I think sales is being able to understand how your company can or can't add value to another company and then understanding what that value is, what would go into making that change and managing that change. Um, and I think sales has changed a lot in recent years or even over its existence where Salespeople used to kind of have all of the information um, and you kind of have that like buyer beware sentiment, right? And nowadays there's so much information available and a lot more transparency, where as a sales rep, it's not really about trying to convince someone or trick someone into your product or service. It's how can we work together to mutually build value and understand what that looks like moving forward. Right. Um, yeah, I think to, to, to kind of piggyback off of what Nick's saying, I think the one of the interesting things you said is that 
sales nowadays, more so than ever, is about meeting and understanding where a prospect is in the buyer's process, what they care about, and catering your solution or your offering in a conversational way to that. Uh, it's funny, I actually think the question of like how different marketing and sales is, is something almost harder to answer nowadays because the mission between the two is very similar. It's how do we take the friction in a buyer's journey uh, a buyer who's very educated and eliminate it. And so a salesperson, when they are in a conversation with a prospect, can very directly do that. I think marketing's job nowadays is to find people out there looking for answers to what your company can solve and eliminate the friction to help them get to a point where they're qualified or ready or willing to digest the content that a salesperson can provide them. Yeah, it's a good point. I think marketing and sales at their core are the same thing. They're both trying to create opportunities for a business. And I think a marketing uh, relationship is how can somebody find and consume that content on their own? And the marketer's job is how can I understand that engagement to the point where I can pass it off to a sales rep where that human interaction might be necessary. Uh, so I think they're both very aligned with the same goal. And how can both reduce friction to eliminate uh, any sort of, I guess, difficulty in that process of becoming potentially a customer? The one thing worth probably clarifying is that like the very stark difference or in terms of marketing and sales tends to come when we're referring to marketing as traditional top of the funnel marketing, yep. driving demand to salespeople. Uh, I think the context that marketing can provide is super valuable for that and just getting more people interested in the door with salespeople. But the job doesn't stop there. And we'll get into this with marketers nowadays. Marketers are very much part of the sales process, helping nurture and progress deals. And moreover, once somebody's a customer, it, marketing can be one of those huge levers to delight a customer into a promoter, uh, an ongoing repurchaser, re-customer, as well as somebody who, who refers and business to your, your company as a whole. No, that's awesome, guys. Yes, thanks, that was thanks, a thanks super thorough overview. description. Yeah, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, you mentioned the, the word context a couple of times in there. I think like leveraging marketing technology like HubSpot, for example, or CRM technology, um, it, it provides a lot more context for that lead. And ultimately that context for that lead means you're not feeding junk over to the sales team, right? You, uh, you, know, you want your sales team focused on the most qualified leads, the ones that have the, the, the highest probability to close, right? And um, you know, especially for organizations that don't have unlimited resources, you've got to really focus where are you spending your, your sales team's efforts on, right? So I think, that tight partnership between marketing and sales actually allows the sales team to be a lot more efficient, right? Um, and to be focused on, like you said, truly qualified opportunities. Yeah, and I think like, it's not to say like, hey, you need a enterprise software like HubSpot to do sales, right? Sure. I think HubSpot or any sort of technology in 2019 helps a sales rep understand not if somebody's qualified, but when a qualified buyer is ready for that conversation. Nice. Yep. I think if you don't have that software or that, that tech stack or that really robust piece of information in front of you, you still should know, hey, why might this person be qualified to buy from me? I might not know when, but let me in a helpful way provide them some information that they can consume on their own time and let us try to earn that person's attention as opposed to steal it. So let's actually, let's segue into another topic now, which is uh, this concept that I know HubSpot has kind of re-released or put out there, this concept of the flywheel, right? We used to talk about marketing and sales as more of a funnel. And now, you know, HubSpot has put out this method. It's, it's kind of like retaking the inbound methodology and spitting it a different way. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> um, but, um, but, I, but I do think that let's spend some time talking a little bit about the concept of the flywheel and what that means for marketing and sales and customer service or customer success. Um, how would you guys describe the flywheel and why that's important to a customer's journey? Right. Uh, yeah, I think it, I was actually reading an article the other day by our VP of marketing, John Dick, uh, where he was 
kind of shockingly transparent around the transition from inbound to flywheel. And he was transparent, yet uh, he was a little cautious about the transition because HubSpot, we were built on the inbound funnel, uh, the inbound methodology, the traditional, how do we drive traffic leads and customers of people who never heard of our brand before. And it kind of stopped there. Sure, there was some CRM, some sales, and we talked about delight and it was important to us. But as a methodology, it was very structured to top of the funnel all the way to close one deal. And how John Dick described it is that the reason we made the shift to this concept of a flywheel is because with a funnel, all of the energy, the man hours, the customer goodwill that goes into a buyer's process kind of ends at the yeah. bottom of a funnel. Right, it's right. it's sort of like, it, it, there's no other better way to put it. You just lose out on all of this goodwill. And what we found is that if you think about your marketing efforts, your sales efforts, and your account management efforts, all as this wheel that kind of builds on top of each other, that energy doesn't get recycled or it doesn't get thrown out. It actually does get recycled across the funnel and expands upon itself. So see marketing and sales and account management all continuing to delight the customer and actually prioritize them uh, because they're our biggest driver of growth. We saw an incredible increase in, in energy across the entire business unit. Yeah. yeah. And just like to add, that's all awesome. I think just in a funnel, customers are output. Right. So how can we change that type of thinking to we did all this work to have an output and we start over like we need to understand that those customers can also be one of, if not the biggest driver of growth for our business. We should focus on growth over customer acquisition. Right. It's funny in this maybe kind of getting into the weeds with HubSpot, but you would think uh, that and we've been here three, four years combined here and uh, the our priorities as the flywheel has transitioned to our lives has actually changed completely too, where most of our efforts were net new sales and they were uh, very focused and, and driven towards that. We now have entire teams called customer growth success teams yeah. that are focused specifically on that. So I think just some ways to that like we've seen are just true business units and teams actually focusing on. So that's a metric that you guys are focusing on more now is like, additional revenue from existing customers or you know, like trying to grow lifetime value for the customer basically right yeah we have an, we have entire teams dedicated to it but i think to, to make it a little practical towards other businesses that are trying to i guess defunnelize themselves yeah, yeah, yeah. moving yeah. over to a fly wheel i, I don't it's, sound like no it's fascinating so i'll give i'm going to give a couple examples from our own experience here um and the way let me just i guess the way i sort of see the flywheel is that you know, it's, it's not a linear process anymore, right? It, it goes around in a circle now. And the idea is like you bring someone in uh, from the market, you bring in like a marketing qualified lead, an inbound lead, right? That lead gets passed off to your sales team. Your sales team closes that lead. Then you probably have a customer success or a customer service team or an account manager, right? That's handling that particular client. And now you put them into the service portion of it, right, the customer success portion. And that's really where you're identifying opportunities to grow your services with that particular client. Perfect example, we brought on a client on, uh, on the marketing and sales hub. And then they realized they were actually using Front as a shared inbox for their service tickets and customer success and all that. And then they realized, holy cow, like we can pull HubSpot Service Hub into all of this and we can actually manage them from the sales, the SDR on the sales team, right? Or from the marketing lead to the SDR and sales team to the customer service rep. And now I'm able to track a lead from lead status, which is new, all the way down to like a ticket for a closed customer, right? And so being able to track that from all the way around the flywheel, I think is something that is a methodology that I think a lot of people don't quite know how to implement process. And I think that's why, like you mentioned, like regardless if it's HubSpot or any other enterprise type software, I think having software in place allows you to follow a process, right? right? All, all, sometimes we just kind of go like willy nilly, we kind of go into the wild west and we do our own things with spreadsheets. No, and, it's easy to lose track. Yeah, and it's disparate really systems and all this other stuff, right? But I think when you have a system which almost 
forces you into a way that still gives you some customization, obviously. But for example, like, uh, like life cycle stages in HubSpot, you can't customize those, right? I, I believe that's, that's the one field like you can't customize. And there's a reason for that, right? Because there's reporting and all this other stuff that happens around it. But I think looking at the flywheel as it applies to technology is something that if you're a company looking from a marketing and a sales standpoint, you also have to incorporate the customer success piece of this as well, right? That's a big part of it. Yeah, that's a good point. And like, in addition to like, cross sell, upsell, stickiness, like things like that. It's easy to see how you can optimize your business to like have a really contextual view of your customers. But from the customer standpoint, that customer experience goes through the roof, that NPS scoring goes through the roof. So when they think of someone they're going to refer to a friend or write a testimonial about or agree to a case study with, even though you might not have additional products, you can upsell your customers, you can get value by providing an awesome experience through adopting the flywheel. Yeah. Right. And I, I think to, to Nick's point, like he's bringing up a lot of metrics that it's, it is really hard to track without some type of platform such as HubSpot. I think software, the mistake of every like, small business or medium sized business owner is they think software is going to solve all of their issues. I think after realizing the importance of the flywheel and customer growth, really what's going to be very impactful is a plan around that. And it just so a plan that's measurable. So the med metrics we tend to use are NPS, like net promoter score, or we actually have soft quotas that are install based, like knowing like how many, how sticky our customers are, or how long they are around. And so it just so happens that HubSpot's customer software platform allows us to easily track that and, and hold ourselves accountable. So having a plan in place, knowing what those metrics are that you want to continue to monitor, and then just making sure you have the ability to actually monitor it, it is why platforms like this are, are impactful. And I will say, now being on, uh, we have two active CRM implementations going on right now on migration. Set up your data correctly in the CRM right. from the very beginning. Right. Practice uh, CRM hygiene because it'll make your reporting a gazillion times easier. In the, CRM hygiene. Yeah, I just coined that phrase. I just, I just, we just completely nerded out on the, on the sales stuff. So let's actually focus in a little bit on the sales part of the flywheel and maybe talk a little bit about how video has maybe changed the way that, you know, we as, you know, a sales team might prospect and reach out to folks. Um, and I know, Nick, you probably have some, you have some experience in this area as well. I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on how video has maybe changed the way that you approach your jobs uh, as you know, being part of the sales team at HubSpot. Yeah, there's so many ways. We'll probably go back and forth on this one. And I've been here two years and I've seen the change. You've been here four years. Like No doubt you've seen the change. I think the way we've thought about it is because sales and marketing seem so delineated, we kind of want to include like top of the funnel marketing in that. Yeah. So like top of the funnel marketing, prospecting, the initial like exploratory conversation, the sales process, onboarding, retention, and employee training. Those are all things that some might be not sales as the old school like thinking, but where we can use video to help grow the business and grow better. So like maybe for the first two, like top of the funnel marketing, like how can we understand engagement with a lead through marketing and video to say, okay, if somebody watched a certain video, they might be interested in a sales conversation. If it's really bottom of the funnel, like something about a case study or maybe a pricing comparison. Or if somebody started watching a video and gave up 20% through, they're probably not ready for a sales conversation. We should either leave that person alone for a bit or maybe put them in a low touch marketing like nurture sequence. Could I stop you there real quick, Nick? So uh, in terms of like technical application to like a HubSpot, you might set up an automation that says, um, if this lead watched uh, these three videos more than 80%, uh, mark them as an MQL, right? And then notify notify the sales team or the marketing team that an MQL has been. You know, yeah. So like, if um if they have taken a level of engagement that you would deem qualified, understand what they did and have a rationale behind that, and then mark them qualified and surface that to either a marketing funnel or a sales rep. So I think the technology is in place now where you can be a little bit more smart about video as opposed to like having a webinar and just praying people attend or seeing if someone signed up and not really knowing if they watched it. 
Um, so I think with marketing, there's a lot of opportunity there. So I, I have a question. Um, how do you figure out um, what video to put up or, you know, how you should create these videos? Because a lot of our clients, you know, obviously there's the obvious videos like this is our product. This is who we are. This is, you know, a little bit about our company. But if you want to get a little bit more direct, how do you go about figuring out what to create? Because video takes a lot longer to create than writing down on a, you know, on a white paper or a blog post or things like that. You know, some of the older, we say old blog posts are old, but yeah, some of the older methods, right? It takes a lot more effort to actually consciously create a video. How do you guys determine that? There's, there's a bunch of ways. I think one thing I've seen a lot of really sophisticated marketing firms do is adopt this concept of show, don't tell. So what I mean, and Marcus Sheridan actually is the sales line. He's a sales coach. He talks a lot about this. Uh, he said that if you're trying to figure out in 2019 an effective way to create some type of content calendar or figure out what videos to make, do a very high level audit of you or your client's site and mark down every area of the site where you have some claim of value or some claim of results. And so like case studies are great examples. Service pages are about us where they talk about being a top agency or even contact us forms where fill out this form and like we'll talk to you and you'll have some consultation and it'll be valuable to you. Make a list of that and then prioritize based on where either your customers are coming from or the biggest claims of value and utilize video as a way to show that rather than tell it through co content and words. So that's, that's just one way. But the, the contact form. Yeah. Yeah. I never, I never, I never thought about that. That's brilliant. Dude. Yeah. And I yeah, have an awesome brilliant. example. Like if you were to look at HubSpot's case study page, like we have hundreds of case studies a year ago, it looks completely different. Most of our case studies now are video first where we'll have the video at the top and then the text case study at the bottom. So you get the actual customer's reaction, kind of how they feel about it and the story um, as opposed to just the text. Yep. Do you guys do a lot of this cold outbound prospecting at outreach? Yeah. So I think a lot of people have the misconception that inbound and outbound can't work together. So I think this kind of lends into prospecting. Like, yeah, there's a ton of really good fit agencies in Los Angeles that I want to talk to that might not have looked at the HubSpot blog. That doesn't mean I'm never going to talk to them or try to talk to them. It's how can I have this concept of inbound selling and reach out to them with something of value. So I think that gets from the marketing side to prospecting. And you don't need a service or a product. Um, so us as partner specialists, we are selling kind of a business model shift. Like, hey, you as an agency could work together with HubSpot to go to market to change the way you operate, expand uh, your service offering and add value to clients to grow your business. It's not like I can demo that, right? Yeah, right. So if I were reaching out to an awesome fit agency in Los Angeles, what I would do is I would pull up their website and I would look at what services do they offer? What types of clients do they work with? Do they have any case studies on there? What type of results do they show? And for me, because I understand our partner program and kind of the agency industry, I can typically tell like, hey, if you're a website design and development agency, you're probably leaving money off the table by not delivering ongoing marketing services. Right. So when I record a video, I'll walk through their website and say like, hey, Andrew, I was checking out your website, like saw that you guys do website development, um, looks like a little bit of like email. Have you ever thought about doing X, Y, Z? Like I work at HubSpot, we help agencies do this all day, uh, a little bit more in detail than that, but then I'll shoot it off. And it's something for that prospect to consume on their own time and a way for me to earn that person's attention as opposed to giving them a ring and hopefully catching them and pitching them. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I actually think that's a, that's a great... Uh, so, so what, so what, what software do you use to do that? Yeah, so we use Vidyard. We actually partner with Vidyard and we use... It in HubSpot. So we have HubSpot video powered by Vidyard. So there's a million different tools. You don't have to use HubSpot. There's free tools. There's Loom. There's Vidyard. There's Wistia. Right. I can Most name them are free. Yeah. You can name 10 right here. Um, but we use Vidyard. Um, there's a lot of personalization you can do there and it natively integrates with HubSpot. Cool. So uh, kind of going on what you were saying, Nick, I think when you, that, that sort of first like outbound, let's call it a cold email, cold video email, okay? 
Would you, would you almost say that that's the equivalent of like a cold phone call or would you say it's better than a, phone, a cold phone call? I mean, I think it's definitely better and more modern. Like if I were to call an agency owner, like first off, if we're selling a partner program, like we need to have a conversation with the decision maker yeah. and a decision maker doesn't want a rep at HubSpot to call them during their lunch break and try to pitch them on a program. Yeah. Like it's really going to fall flat. It's not going to stand out. They get calls from reps all the time. So when you're doing this type of video engagement, it's highly personalized. And even if it isn't a good fit, a lot of these recipients, these prospects will get back to you and be like, wow, that was awesome that you sent that. Like that really stood out. Like I've been offered other sales jobs for doing it. Like, hey, this is awesome. Like if you ever think about making a change, like reach out. It's just an easy way to stand out and like modernize your approach. Right. I think yeah. a, a good way to, to conceptualize this is what Nick's describing is figuring out what a prospect or which really what a, what a person cares about and attempting at least to align what we offer in a way that aligns with what their biggest concerns, their biggest dreams and biggest cares are. Uh, the second part of that is allowing them to digest what they want in the medium or time frame that they want. So that's why you see such a big rise in chat, the conversational marketing, video marketing, as well as still landing pages and forms because they still work for the people that want to consume it in that way. So I think this just gives a really great opportunity for someone on their own time to make that decision and allow you to earn that opportunity. Yeah, I, I also think it's interesting because um, when you're sending someone a video like that, you're clearly customizing a piece of content for yeah. them. And in a day and age where, you know, email drip campaigns and- It's also you know, white you, label automated. Yeah, yeah. everything's yeah. automated. And you can tell that this is just an SDR drip sequence or whatever, right? Um, that I think that definitely puts you on better footing if that person is interested. I would say right? even, especially now because you're audiences so educated on all these different you know like everybody knows what yep. an email campaign is you know when you sign up for that email no matter what it is you're going to get like you know 100 emails yep. over the next whatever amount of time so yeah personalizing it and and making it it's just that one it's i don't it's kind of funny but it's almost that old school door to door sure like you can yeah. see somebody face to face and obviously it's not as intrusive but yep. um you know, it's a lot harder to say something <laughs> no yep. to somebody when they're actually in your face. But yep. uh, so Nick um, and John, so I actually I saw a post, I think it was from your boss, Nick. You, she said she your her direct report. I saw something about somebody trying out outbound sales, like outbound sales videos. And there was like uh, some metric around conversion rate. Do you I don't first of all, I don't know if she was referencing you, but I thought it was you. Um, yeah, so was it you? It was, okay. <laughs> yeah, we're we're really lucky here at HubSpot to have like a lot of autonomy in our sales process and like uh, try things out that might not have been tried before. And before we incorporated video into HubSpot, when we had kind of just found out about Vidyard, a few reps on the floor had started using video in their sales process. So I was a new rep. I was kind of stepping into a territory, Los Angeles, that had kind of been hammered by cold email. So I felt like if I were just to send out a bunch of cold emails, it's going to fall flat. So instead of actually prospecting by cold calling, I just sent a bunch of videos, personalized to the recipients, and got a, a substantial number of leads and customers because of it. I don't remember the exact metric, but it's just doing something to differentiate yourself. So you saw a lift. There was a lift from like taking the extra effort to make the video, to go through their website, to record it, and send that in an email. Yeah, it was a huge lift. Um, yes. Something like we we typically talk to 30, 35 opportunities uh, a month. And I think you were up to 50, 55 people. Wow. Like, yeah. okay. And probably warmer opportunities too. That's, that's yeah. Because you can, it's very easy to catch someone on the phone who doesn't really want to talk to you. And they're going to agree to take a meeting next week and not show up. Not, right? yeah. Like that's an opportunity. But like, these are actually opportunities where, hey, we've demonstrated a little bit of value, at least enough for you to have an exploratory conversation and show you like, hey, I'm a human being, you're a human being, we work for companies, like let's figure out if there's a way we can work together. And if not, it's part way as friends. People buy from people and they buy because it's their idea, not your idea. So what better way for it to be their idea than for them to watch a video on their own time and actively choose to book time with you? So. Yep. 
cool. Yeah. So I guess maybe we can wrap on this last this last topic I really wanted to talk about, which was taking a more consultative approach uh, to sales. You talked about providing value in that first like video email, right? Um, and I actually took Dan Tyre's uh, pipeline generation bootcamp. So I learned a lot about sort of a HubSpot methodology and approach to sales. And you know, the, 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 the main theme was you're not there to sell, you're there to help, right? Um, and I think that resonates with me, not only from a sales, but a marketing as well as a customer success standpoint, right? So maybe kind of pulling this all back together, um, what is the importance of helping when you're trying to close a deal? And how have you changed maybe your approach um, if you had a previous sales position before, like when you came into HubSpot, how did that sort of methodology or that culture at HubSpot change you as a person, as a rep, you know, as, as a professional? Right. Yeah, I, I, I wish I, it, I could talk about this for a while. I, I even at HubSpot, I, as a BDR uh, prospect, and I think I learned this lesson the hard way to some degree, uh, to give you some perspective, I did a lot of cold outreach and like yes there was some personalization to it but cold as in i didn't give people really an option of when or how to digest my messaging and i really tried hard to push them down a certain path the funnel i guess if you will so i would call people i'd say the positioning statements i was just learning as a new hire of course, they'd sort of land. I'd, I'd ask questions that no one could say really no to. And then I'd ask for a meeting. Uh, they'd schedule it because I'd ask them to pull up their calendar. And I'd, I'd leave the call and I'd wait for my rep or my, my closing rep to talk to that person. And no one ever showed up, really, because it wasn't their idea. They didn't care. And maybe I was just like annoying. But at the same time, uh, I think what I learned, and, and it took a lot of pain and struggle for me to learn this, is that whole concept of people buy when it's their decision. They talk to you when it's their decision. And they really, the job of a salesperson is to take what they learn from marketing, from account management, from all the conversations they have with like minded peers and eliminate friction. Uh, so the people, when you align what people care about with what you can offer, as long as it actually can be a solution that makes sense for them, the only thing that's going to stop them if they see that from buying from you are hurdles and objections. So understanding like what they care about, what's keeping them up at night, what's stopping them from hitting their goals, asking those questions and then helping them solve that in a consultative way. I think that's really the, the big job for the salesperson. So, yeah, and just one thing I want to add, like I think in order to be helpful, you kind of have to change the way you think about sales. So I think it really clicked for me and it made my sales process much better when I went into a conversation thinking that I don't know if HubSpot's right for this company, as yep. opposed to thinking like, yeah, HubSpot's going to be awesome for this company. Yep. If I'm lucky enough to have an agency book time in my calendar with the description of we want to buy HubSpot, like I try not to get happy years and think through, okay, like why would this company buy HubSpot? How would it help them? And does it make sense for them? Instead of going into it with a closing mindset, it's more of an exploratory, helpful, like let's figure out how this is helpful together. And then at the end of the sales process, you'll thank yourself because you understand why this company would move forward, what it means for them to move forward. And it's a lot easier to button up a deal. Right. Yeah, I think an example of that that's really that I've learned over the past, really over the past year, is the power of the knowledge of all the other conversations you have. So yeah. you talk to a thousand, depending on your volume, you talk to a thousand people similar to the person you have on the phone. So you learn a lot, probably more than you realize. So it's kind of your job to digest that information. Uh, a habit of salespeople is to push the conversation towards what they think is going to drive the sale. So when a prospect or a customer comes up out of the blue with something that you don't normally help with, it's really natural for a salesperson to try to dispel that or and move on. So for example, agencies asking about like hiring help. We're not re we're a marketing and sales and service software. Mm -hmm. So like it's very easy for me to push past that and start talking about like their marketing and sales. Right. Yep. But most people that's the reason they're telling you that is there's a there's a reason for that. That's what they care about right now. So over time it, it doesn't happen overnight. The more you learn from other agencies, you might not be an expert at it, but you can be a liaison for conversations. You can give tips and 
it's not until they get over what they just told you or talk to you and feel good about it that they're going to want to talk about where your sale and marketing meets their concerns. So. I'm glad you guys brought that up. In fact, my part of my you know, sales process, the, the first line that I usually open with when I have either a, a cold or a warm prospect is, hey, I'm not sure if we're the right fit for each other, right? But if you give me 15 minutes, we can figure out if we're the right fit for each other. If we're not, then it's, it'll be awesome to meet you. We can grow a relationship together. If we are, then there's a couple more steps that we have to walk through to make sure that we are actually a good fit for each other. And it takes an investment on both of our sides to see that. You're gonna to have to spend time with me. You're gonna to have to open up the kimono a little bit, right? Just tell me about your business and what your business does. Um, but I think, I'll, I think the defense kind of, the, their defense mechanisms kind of fall down when they kind of feel like, oh, like he knows that we might not be a good fit. You know what I mean? And so I think that psychologically um, puts yeah, them in a better a place. First. Yeah, it's kind yeah. of like a date, yeah, right? Yeah, a and date. then I think tying this back to video, I think tone of voice and um, being able to just sh like show empathy, right? Comes through a lot better on video, yeah, totally. obviously. Well, yeah, right? Yes. And so when I, when I give that like re first reply to like, uh, like an inbound lead, for example, hey, I'm Andrew, I'm the agency owner. Uh, we have a, our process is just to establish fit. We might not be a good fit, but I'd love to just meet you. I think they get that, you know, through the video and like, I'll get responses like, yeah, we're really looking forward to meet you, exclamation mark, you know, which is, which is usually kind of a good sign. It's a good tell, mm -hmm. you know? So I found that that helps my sales process enormously when you're just like, we got to establish fit, you know? Yeah. I think prospects respect that. And similar, like in the sales process, I say like, Hey, this isn't meant to be a pitch. It's meant to be a conversation. I don't know how HubSpot can solve your problems or if they can, like let's learn together. And like you brought up a good point about like defensiveness, like outside of prospecting, using video in the sales process is the easiest way to appear human. You're not talking to yeah. a voice. You're not talking to a HubSpot sales bot over in Boston, Massachusetts. Yeah. Like I can take a call from home and have my dog in the background and still have an intelligent conversation about why it might make sense to become a HubSpot partner. And I think um, you had a good point on like face-to-face -face meetings and how those compare with like um, over video. Yeah, I think that it was a huge, we use Zoom over here, but there's a ton of video tools that anybody that's listening could, could pick up yep. tomorrow and start to use. There's a huge, like when I first started, no one was using video during the sale. And I think we found that a part of removing friction in the buyer's journey is establishing continuity. So when someone talks to you again, they know what the experience is going to be like. So when someone gets a video in the inbox, they're going to have a similar conversation with that same person over video. And it allows you to pick up a ton on what, what you guys just mentioned, not just the, the vocal tonality, but really the experience of, of how you are coming across and how they're interpreting that. So, yeah. And you're a, you're a sales line now because you did the, the boot camp, right? Yep. So I think like one of Dan Tyre's big things is like, um, and it might be a little extreme, but like a sale is won or lost in the first like five or 10 minutes, like rapport building. It's much easier to have a conversation and build rapport and actually seem genuine when you can look each other in the, in the eyes over a screen. <laughs> the most traditional things are the most uh, traditional corporate inside sales companies. One of the most expensive things, just selfishly, when you're thinking about running a sales or marketing team was ramping reps and the cost of a totally. hire. Yep. And it, what we found is that only the most either naturally gifted conversationalists or people that have had enough opportunities and experience to just pick up on vocal tones just strictly over the phone were the ones that could be really successful. And so if you either weren't naturally gifted or just didn't have enough opportunity, it took a ton of time to ramp up and it was really good point. tough for, yeah, even that's for a me. Point. Yeah. So it, it just, it makes it so much easier to be able, because they don't have that disadvantage. They have more advantages for a new hire to, to ramp up now. I'll, uh, I'll tag on to that anecdote. Actually, one of our SDRs came in, uh, actually took Dan Tyre's boot camp as well, had never placed a cold call in his entire life. So naturally the guy's like terrified, you know, to, to get on the phone and make a phone call like we all would be, right? Um, or most of us would be for that matter. Uh, but so we started thinking through this a little bit and we're like, hey, you know what? Like, let's just give video a shot. Do you feel more comfortable with video? 
no problem. Got on video, well-spoken, articulate, you know what I mean? The personality came through a little bit better and I told him, okay, no cold calls for you. Uh, let's just focus on video. Spend your time making these videos. And if you do get someone who's interested, then you pick up the phone and then it's a warm prospect at that point. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, it's a lot more It's a little bit easier for you to do, so. Yeah, I, and a I lot see of that. it when you're a, sorry, when you're a new BDR, you're afraid to make dials to random people who have never heard from you and you don't know them. So at least having that first interaction, it's like, hey, this person just gave me permission to have a conversation with them. Yep. And that will it builds immensely confidence. help. Yeah, yes. it builds a little bit of confidence. And I think mm -hmm. the confidence thing, it reflects in your tone of voice, like all that stuff, you know? It's yeah, it's worth noting that this, to go back to the flywheel, this extends to not just sales, but I mean, especially marketing, onboarding, uh, renewal managers on our team, but everything account management related. So instead of just having a kickoff call where in the past, you'd send an introductory email introing their account manager. Now they get a video from that account manager saying hi. And then when they get on the kickoff call, they have a, they're on a video conference with that same person. So the, the experience doesn't stop at sales. It, it, it actually just begins there. That's a great, That's a great point. point. Actually, yeah, great um, point. we just onboarded a client. Uh, so we, are, we had a client purchase uh, HubSpot, Growth Suite, and we're migrating their CRM right now. And as I... To get them onboarded onto the CRM, actually what we did was we created a bunch of videos to show them how to get, hey, you know, set up your deal properties here, you know, select these options here. And it was just a hundred times easier than having to type everything out in a freaking Google Doc, you know what I mean? Um, so like our team was like a lot happier and they were like, dude, this is awesome, you know? So I, I see that as well on the customer success side, on the onboarding side, that there's a lot of opportunity. To yeah, them. and a lot of that, like if you're helping someone solve an issue, it probably takes you a ton of time to find the right article and write up a description and answer all that over text. And it's pretty easy to explain over video if you're familiar with it. And it also comes across as more personal. So like a good example in the sales process, I'm sure a ton of salespeople who might be listening, like the prospect has a question about the contract that is holding up them from signing. Instead of having to set up another call, I'll just kind of walk through the contract line item by line item, like explaining what everything means, send it over. And then if that helps and makes sense, they're comfortable moving forward. Um, or maybe from a customer like retention standpoint or an upsell cross sell motion, if we roll out a new product, I can say, hey, it looks like you're using this product. We just released this. Check it out. This is what you can do. If it makes sense, like let's have some time and talk about this. Yeah, it's just shocking, actually, when we were coming up, like preparing for this episode, thinking about all of the areas of our job and company that in the past two or three years, this isn't a 10 year thing, over the past two or three years were replaced or amplified by video. So I think, yeah, like tech updates, a lot of follow up. So rather than write a long customized follow up, I'll talk it through and send the links that I'm telling them about uh, below that. I think it bleeds past that too, bleeds past sales. They're like internal trainings. Uh, any of our, our product updates that we're learning or marketing updates, a new campaign going out, our, our head of marketing sends a video to us that we can watch. So in general, there's a lot more, there's a lot less friction internally as well. Cool. Yeah. Dude. Uh, Man, I just got schooled. Yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's not often that Jared is as quiet as he is yeah. today. But, I just um, got schooled. But no, guys, this is, uh, this was awesome. I and, and I just want to put it out there for any of our listeners um, you know, one thing that, you know, this partnership that we've had with HubSpot is, you know, HubSpot has done a lot of experimentation as like Nick and John have said, right? And so a lot of the benefit of our partnership is we get a lot of the information, yeah. right? From guys like yourselves or Rob or Cam or Susanna or CC, right? And so we share a lot of this information with our clients. So if you are a business out there, B2B or a B2C business who wants to figure out how to build this flywheel and how to even set up if you have an, a really outbound outreach process, you know, talk to us because a lot of what Nick and John described in this podcast are exactly what we do and we set up for our clients to help them build strategies to allow their sales, marketing, and customer success teams to be more successful in helping their customers grow. Right? Yeah, I'll tack on to that. So just uh, to touch on like the amount of experimentation that you guys do and you're so open about it, 
makes it that much easier to understand what actually wins. And at the end of the day, that's what counts, right? Yeah, and a lot so, of things lose, right? Right, right. So but the fact like, that, that, but that HubSpot is so willing to share the losses yeah. mm -hmm. and kind of just like walk you through why this, these things are happening, uh, I think is just invaluable. And that's, you know, it's just, it makes you guys stand above so many other, you know, similar type companies. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's yeah, really encouraging to hear. I think one thing too, I'm excited to figure out like what HubSpot does with video in the future. Like we don't know as individual sales reps, but even like watching TV last night, I saw TurboTax. Like they had a commercial where uh, you yeah, can yeah, yeah, I saw their it. app, like yeah. literally speak with the CPA as you yep. go through that process. Like I actually very much need that. So <laughs> I'll, probably, I'll probably be doing that soon. I think the what I've yeah, when people ask us what the future of video and sales and marketing is, we I mean, we don't know the answer. I think the, the, you can look at trends and you can look at where the market's going. Uh, where traditionally the buyer didn't have a lot of information 10, 15 years ago and the seller had all of the information, we've seen that change where the buyer has all of the information. And what we've talked about, our job is to remove friction so that they can come to a decision. I don't think that's going away at all. That's the one yeah. thing I can certainly say. I think I'd imagine it's going to double down. So the the, mar the companies, the platforms, the businesses like yours that are future-minded and start to think of ways that we can continue to double back down on that customer-centric attitude, that's where I'd invest. And that's where I think the market is probably going. AI, chat, as it relates to video, there's probably... Countless examples like the TurboTax of the world where more traditional businesses are catching up to where you guys are too. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, well, one question. Do you guys want to leave the audience with anything? Um, and it could be HubSpot related or not HubSpot related. Just some like good words of advice outside of everything that you already just gave. Uh, maybe like one more tidbit. <sighs> I don't know. You want to go first? I'll throw you on the spot there. <laughs> wow. Thank you, man. Uh, yeah, there's a few ways we could take it. If you guys want to talk uh, uh, HubSpot, Flyway related, uh, talk to these guys and then talk to us after at some point if you want or you guys can intro us. Uh, I think for me, I, I target it more towards the salespeople, especially people that are newer to the role because uh, it's really close to heart for me, this transformation, how it's affected what I do. It wasn't until I thought the question, if I was whoever's on the other side of the phone or video, what would I do? And, and to unpack that, I mean, quite literally, when I come into their office as the leader of their business, what would be my next move? It wasn't until I thought of that in every single conversation. And at first, I literally had it written down on my computer that I started to see traction and connection in conversational relations with my prospects and customers. Uh, so my thought is if you are a salesperson that's new or considering it, even in your day-to-day, -day, you start to ask yourself that question, put yourself in their shoes. And I know it's a little easier said than done, but I promise you'll get there. Yeah. And I think to lamely kind of tag on, oh, mine's, yeah. mine's kind of like sales related too, but one of my biggest things as a newer rep was getting comfortable with video, like in the same way that your SDR wasn't comfortable sending a specific calling. Um, it's really uncomfortable to send a video of yourself, put yourself out there, talk to this stranger and send it. Are they going to make a meme out of you? Are they going to YouTube? They will. Thank you. I can't wait for the Nick memes. <laughs> um, That's so when you know you made like, it, Nick. <laughs> yeah. So just being comfortable talking and with making mistakes, saying, um, it's not a big deal. It makes you more approachable, more human. Embrace the mistakes. Definitely. Cool. Good, good yeah, checks, great guys. advice. Yep. Thank you, guys. Um, Nick, it's awesome to have you back on here. Thank you so much for your time. John, pleasure to meet you. Thank you for coming on. Hopefully we can do this guy, uh, again, guys, and have you guys both on because you know that was like a ton of knowledge and uh, it's always cool to chat it up with you guys. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Have the invite, yeah. Cool. I think that's going to wrap it up for episode four in this series. Um, as always, guys, don't forget, you can check out the show notes. We're going to list everything that we talked about here as much as we can. Of course, you can rate, subscribe, check us out anywhere you can find a podcast, iTunes, Google, or Spotify. And uh, we'll see you on the next one.